So good morning and dobar dan. I've just uh, learned this in the last five years being in Serbia. This is the only word I can speak in Serbian. Um, I think it will just take its time. It will be there. It's okay. Okay. So for this to be okay, it has to work. Uh, okay, it's changing something. Uh, I can operate, but it's very difficult to operate computers. My daughter does this better than me. Um, yes, okay, so there it comes. Can you see all of that? So what do I do? I just sort of play with this. Okay, so I was asked to come and talk to you this morning about robotics uh, in colorectal surgery in Serbia. So I, I looked at uh, Google search yesterday to find out that what is the state of play of robotics in Serbia. And I have this information that there are no surgical robots in Serbia. So effectively, you know, I can finish my presentation now and, and, and you, you, can have, you can have a very good day. But then I thought I have come this far and my friends would be very upset. So I should say something about robotics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just give you an idea of some of the history and where we are generally in robotics and hopefully um, give you a way of how Serbia would get there, which I'm sure they would. So this is a very famous picture. This is um, a very famous painting. Uh, we as a surgical colleague believe that this guy over here, if you can see it, is a surgeon. Probably this is a surgeon in Penchivo. Who, who probably thinks that he's doing the work of a god. You know, his, his work really is an extension of God's arm. But if you just focus very carefully here, you can almost imagine that this is almost the shape of a head or a skull, if you imagine. So, probably sometime in surgery, decisions are far more important than decisions, and that's the hardest thing to learn. Now, the surgeons are trying to change with technology, and they are looking for another hand to touch. Not the hand of the God, the hand of machine because we believe that perhaps this would solve all our problems. i just give you an idea of, this is just a generic um, slide just to share with you, that within our specialty, which is a colorectal surgery, from 1970 to up until now, the biggest revolutions have been numbered, but I just put some there. You know, fibro optic endoscopy became popular in early 1970s, pouch surgery was seen as a standard in early 1980s, and Alan Parks was the guy who populated it more at St. Mark's Hospital. And then lab colorectal surgery came in the early 90s, and now robotics and different ways of doing rectal cancer. So you could see that evolution or the problem with time. The problem with time is that it only flows in one direction, whether we like it or not. But it has something very important for colorectal surgeons to think about. Robotics is often seen as disruptive innovation, or disruptive innovations in, in some ways are those that uh, produce a product to the market that completely change the mindset of the market. So in surgery, for example, um, the starting of endovascular stenting in vascular surgery reduced the population of vascular surgeon in Western world. You know, there are not many vascular trainees now who wants to become vascular surgeon because a lot of that work is done by endoluminal stenting and the radiologists are doing a lot of that work. It's really interesting if you look at automation industry that it was not just the Ford making newer and newer cars that replace the horses on the, on the face of the world. It was this Model T that changed the market if you look at the research because that suddenly made it possible for the general population to buy this. So it became accessible to the vast majority of society, and suddenly there was no need to have anything else other than this. And I think the same would hold true with robotics. There would be a, a, a tipping point where it would become generalizable, it would become accessible to people, and then perhaps the numbers would change dramatically. So I asked the question that, are we going to be just like horses? Do you know that uh, a population of horses on planet Earth have fallen by 20% in the last century? Because we don't need them for wars, we don't need them for making, uh, plowing them in the field or pulling the carriages anymore. We just need them as a recreational 
to more and more. So the population is not needed. Is it the same problem we as a colorectal surgeon might have? I'll give you an example. Have a look at this. This is the data which is slightly older, 2014, but you could see the trend. The new cases of colon and rectal cancer surgery are doing, going downward, and the deaths uh, are also showing the downward trend. Uh, Nunu, my colleague, would tell you that everybody should have radiation and wait and watch because that's the new trend as well. So less and less people requiring an operation now. So are we going to have the same problem as a colorectal tribe that we would become like 20% less globally? Who knows? Just to give you an idea, this is from 1942. This was the first time that the word robot was introduced in one of the fiction cartoon movies. Waldo was the name of the robot and this was the guy who looks very scary actually himself, but he was the guy who for the first time sort of thought the robot would be something that would change the world in 1942. Initially, it was really used for doing something remote like a robotic arm working in nuclear, uh, nuclear reactors, uh, moving uranium around. And the idea really was a master-slave concept, which means you move something on the control and the arm respond to it. It doesn't have a mind of its own. And the same thing applies today, even in the modern robotics. Then, in the 1980s, this is the first uh, surgical robot they used for neurosurgical biopsies in the US. It was just a single arm used for taking uh, a stereotypic biopsies at a particular area. And then, 1980s uh, saw this arm development into a number of other fields. Nuclear material, obviously, this is largely work done in Munich. The Germans were designing the arms. Those arms were used in uh, NASA uh, International Space Station to do the repairs outside the ISS, as they call them. And then some of the robotics were used for doing deep sea exploration uh, and so forth. So it was becoming more and more popular to send the robots somewhere where they could not access easily. A laparoscopy obviously came in in 1960s and not uh, 1980s, and, and, and suddenly changed the dynamics of uh, general surgery uh, in general. So people suddenly became interested in this part. So almost sort of robotic de development was put on the side because this was the new thing. We all wanted to learn this. And it found its place very, very quickly because the, the, the instruments were easier to design and they were easier to get access to. It's interesting that there were no surgical robots before 1999. So this is just the timeline you have to remember, which is about, what, two, 1999, uh, if I do the maths correctly, I think it's about 20 years, yeah. So whatever you see today in terms of technological advances is the work of 20 years of progress only. In a big scheme of things, this is a small timeline. This is one of the first um, robot that was uh, developed really by uh, Stanford Research Institute and their idea was really that you sit remotely, you have an image looking down, you have a manipulator in your hand and it moves the workspace away. This is the first sort of thing uh, they were trying to do. This concept was bought in 1990s by uh, surgical robotics which became intuitive surgical subsequently and produced their first clinical robot. So this is the timeline really for people who are seeing the robotics for the first time. I know a lot of my colleagues know all about it. 1999 started with a, a three-arm system. It's called uh, Intuitive Surgical or Da Vinci, they call it. And then in 2003, they added the fourth arm to it. 2006 came up with uh, this 3D HD vision, uh, cross quadrant access. You could do this. It went on to have a third generation of robot. It's called SI. And then the fourth generation, which is an XI system, uh, almost sounds like car, car models, you know, they keep changing every, every now and then. But this is the newest technology they had uh, been in practice now since 2014. What are the advantages? The advantages obviously are a magnified view. You look through these uh, two individual lens for your eyes, so you can see it up to 10 times magnification. You almost feel that your eyes are inside the patient. Um, as you're doing it. But there is a slight problem with this 3 definition, high, 3D high definition view that your mistakes also are also in 3D and high definition for everybody to see. So it is really important for surgeons to learn this properly and do this properly because you cannot do a bad robotic surgery for a very long time. You will be stopped. Somebody will stop you because it is on the screen for everybody to watch. This is an advantage. The human wrist can go up to a certain point. You have restriction on it. 
and you have this wrist that goes circumnavigationally in a very tight narrow spaces and this may confer advantage in certain part of the body. Obviously uh, this is something that uh, hospitals are really not interested in. People who sign the check they are not interested in surgeons living longer or living healthier. They just want more work to be done. But laparoscopy have got high incidence of neck injuries or difficulty with posture and it changes when you sit down and do the operation like this comfortably. This is the setup. So um, I'm, I'm not going to play all of this. I'm just going to, uh, this is, I took it from, from the guys who are, just to give you an idea, this is the fourth generation robotic system. This is a commercial video, by the way, uh, which is available now if you look on the internet. Uh, this is an X system and you can see it does a lot of tasks. You can sort of suture better. This is the new instrument they are introducing now, which is a single port access or single access surgery. And so they, they, the technology have moved. You know, they have now table that moves with a robot attached to it. You don't have to disconnect the robot, which also facilitate operating in a very steep positions. Um, you get an idea what I was trying to sort of show you. Okay, so this is just to give you um, an example. I don't know whether it would work. If it works, uh, we'll see. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something which one of our fellow published. Um, this is just to give non-colorectal people some idea of what robotic surgery is. You insufflate the abdomen, uh, you put four ports in one row, metallic ports, um, and then have an assistant port to give you an idea. They are six to eight centimeter apart, and you're working in this area from here up to here. Uh, and once you have attached, um, you have insufflation, you put ports in, you put the patient head down, use the normal instrument to expose your operative field. That doesn't change because you're doing robotic surgery, it should be the same. And once you, you got an idea here, uh, for people who are not worse with this, this is a laser guided targeting system. You bring the robot to the patient, attach the arm, and then the machine configure itself and goes into the position where there is no arm um, conflict. So a lot of this physics is done by the computer that is behind this, um, which is, which is a, a novel way. Operation is exactly the same. Uh, the anatomy of Homo sapien has not changed for the last 200,000 years. So that's the good news for young surgeons. They're not going to find something new. You know, they will be the same thing to look at. Uh, so you learn the anatomy, and Dr. Kuzu will tell you more and more about anatomy. This is inferior mesenteric artery that you chase. And although this is a, a video which is, it is slightly speed up obviously, you haven't got a button as yet where the robot does that all by itself, but this is where it's heading to. Automation is where this is gonna go. Uh, and I'll just move it forward in the interest of time because you don't need to see any of this stuff. Um, this is the main artery, um, again, three clips, better to have three clips, one for the surgeon, one for the patient and one for the lawyer. You know, this is very important that you sleep well at night. If you can name the vessel, you should clip it. Then you are basically just using, you see the, the movement of your scissor are just like a paintbrush that you are using it for. I go down further, I don't know whether this would um, run. Yes, it would be. In a night, so in a, in a tight, narrow spaces, there is an advantage in running this. I'll just sort of move it forward out of this. Yeah, this is, this is probably the pelvic video part, same patient. This is a patient we operated in Lisbon. Me and Nuno probably would, Nuno would remember this guy. Um, this is a, a really nice narrow space and you start the pelvic dissection at the back. If you imagine, really, it is micro traction. The difficulty is you can't feel how much to push because there is no haptic feedback to you. So you have to rely on your visual clue how much traction is necessary. If you look at the robotic instrument at the moment and you see what the machine movements are, you can almost imagine that the machine can learn this very quickly. And where this would go in the next few years is potentially the machine would learn the pattern how the surgeon is moving this and they can reproduce the same movement based on MRI scan for specific part of the operation. So it's almost like autopilot doing the surgery partly while you are babysitting it because the society would not trust the machine completely. 
as we don't do the pilots, for example. These are the new systems which are coming in. This is a, a British system now recently launched called uh, CMR, Cambridge Medical Robotic. This is their promotional video that they put on the, um, on the web, I think. And let's see if I can move it forward. Um, I don't know, it has to be back and it has to be there. No, sorry. We got an idea. It would be nice to see it if it plays because this is a nice system to show. No. It would work now, yes. Uh, this is, each arm is individual arms. They come uh, from different sides of the patient. So they are describing this as a modular robotic system. Um, and they go through a five millimeter laparoscopic instrument, so you don't need a specially device uh, ports to do these. Um, obviously, it has its limitation because they have 20 years of technological gap they have to catch up with. Uh, whether this would prove um, as effective as the current robotic system is, it will become clear to the surgical, surgical community when more and more people will adapt it. Uh, the difference is it's an open console, so you're looking at the big screen with the 3D glasses on. So you don't, you go away from the immersive view, which was consistent with robots. So it's almost like 3D laparoscopy, some might say. But you have angulated instrument um, that does its thing. And it'd be interesting to see when they would be able to show some clinical data that this is possible to do this. I move out of this. This is Metronic. They are, go they are going to launch a robot. It's called Einstein Project. Similar concept individual arms on the wheels, open console, and the machine. So it's interesting how they are moving away from immersive view and going on to the open arms. This is um, a, a, sp a spinal surgical robot called Mesorex. This is currently being used, I think, in America uh, for only for spinal surgical indication. Here, the concept is also exactly the same. Single arm, as you have seen, and bit of automation, and master-slave concept to use it. Uh, Titan is a Canadian company. They are going to launch uh, a single port robot with flexible endoscopy. Uh, so you can use a single port and flexible arm would come out of it. Um, they, they are seeking FDA approval by the end of the year to launch this system. This is um, a, a shape of things to come as, as it is often this is a single port robotic uh, system that Da Vinci Surgical have just launched. They are seeking FDA approval for colorectal procedure. So there would be one port, it's about 30 millimeter, so about three, three centimeter, four centimeter, and you have these three instruments and a camera uh, that would move with those, and you can sort of sit and work with all these arms uh, using a single port. It would have some limitation, and limitation obviously would be the specimen size, where you take it out, and other problems that can come with it. But at the moment, in a narrow space, like through transoral surgery or, uh, or transanal surgery, you know, in the rectum, this could have benefit using certain procedures. So we know this, this is 25 millimeter cannula system. Uh, they are seeking FDA approval. This is the concept here. The space where all these three instruments and a camera would work is, is almost like a shape of this tennis ball. So this is the limitation effectively because you would have a torque forces working against it sometime. Other problem is the length of the instruments because now uh, this is targeted mainly at American population. American population BMI is going up and up and up. So they have difficulty reaching in deep pelvises sometimes using the same model unless you push it way further, the cannula. This is the concept. You can work in one angle. You can rotate the camera the other way around and you can work above the camera and below the camera. So, you know, this is something that people have to sort of get used to using this. If it plays, this is a cadaveric dissection of transanal procedure done through in the lab work just to give you an idea of how the system works. So it is possible to do this because you could see that you have a very static, stable view and you can use the arm. The difficulty is the counter-traction hand often become a problem with a narrow space. We know that 
uh, that in, pel in, in rectal cancer surgery or pelvic surgery, the counter-traction hand is a problem. There are other specialties which are currently using this system or thinking of using this system. This is a Korean group. They are taking the thyroids out through a, a submental approach. So they go, you know, making a tunnel through here and take the thyroid out. The urologists are trying to do uh, perineal cystectomies through this approach. There's a cadaver work being done. This is the problem that I sort of suggested or I was sort of going through, which the limitation of the system would be. And it has a potential really for this particular uh, specialty to have some need or area of niche uh, in peculiar uh, group of surgical procedure. There are other things that are changing as well, just with the robot. Um, this is uh, ICG technology where you can map out the lymph node, you can look at the perfusion patterns, uh, you can also look at localization of the tumor with lymphatic channels. So a lot of that would come as more and more robotics would come in. I'm not too sure if you would have a voice on this, but I don't know whether this would play with a voice. That's the difficulty. Okay. But this is a... Probably it doesn't have a voice. This is um, a, a quite an interesting video because this software that they are using during this operation is calculating where the anato anatomical structure are and there is a woman voice warning you where the ureter is and then they also say that at this current speed this operation would finish in 45 minutes. So they can predict just like a GPS system. It didn't have a voice, but that was the idea of showing you. This is interesting now with China pushing the 5G technology. This is a Chinese robot. And for the first time, they demonstrated in public domain, this is a surgeon operating 40 miles away from animal lab using a 5G technology to move the arm of the robot in a pig model. This is going to come a lot faster than we think. This is about one hundredth of a second delay in when he moves the arm and something moves 40 or 30 miles away from him. China are going to launch their robotic system fairly soon, but this, this is one thing where, which they want to take an edge on, intuitive surgical, I suppose, is to look at remote operating using a 5G technology. So this is really here in, in the near future. This probably won't play, so I won't waste my time. I'll just finish off by showing you this. This is 2004. Some of you must have seen this picture before. I've seen you, shown you this picture. This is when Curiosity landed on Mars and it opened the camera shutter and looked back to where it has come from. You look at these three dots. So this is where Panchivo is, this little dot here, right? So this is 2004. You know, see how quickly we have uh, progress in time, now we are looking at colonizing Mars and, and so forth. So technology would move a lot faster than we think. So if you ask me in conclusion, I showed you a slide and said there are no robotic system in Serbia, so I could finish my talk then. If you ask me, I would conclude by saying there will be robotic system in Serbia and, Se European, and Serbian surgeons, some sitting in this hall, some who are young and aspiring to become surgeons, would be using all of these technologies because remember time always flows in one direction but Penchio team have started their journey uh, a while back on the bicycle trying toward the robotic road so I just kept this picture for Maladin to remember when he would be looking for robot this is where it all started just outside his ho house on a few bicycles thank you very much for your attention thank you very much